black pajamas like the no theater. this story but about four years ago now I um, was with a little combo that I played with and we did a benefit for Leonard Peltier and after we got done and I had been singing songs rock and roll songs and reading poems that ran into rage about the you know genocide of the American West and this guy comes up to me and it says that you know while you were performing I heard this voice speak to me it identified itself as your spiritual grandfather, like my spiritual grandfather, um, asking me, and I, I had this conversation, and I, might, I had two, it was like Pascal's wager, I had two choices, when I could blow this guy off completely, or there was something to this, you know, it was just like in some weird, you know, chaotic way, you know, I was supposed to get in touch with myself, so I'll do a couple of love songs. Muffins 
Dogs race across the snowy field. Tree trunks stand out against clouds of steel. We sit and watch as we keep on moving. Oh, there's nothing warmer. Well, thank you for all coming. Good evening. Uh, my name is Ron Sorrow, and I'm the owner of Avol's Bookstore. And before I introduce our uh, featured reader tonight, I just want to make a few announcements. Um, some of you may have heard uh, a rumor going around that there was a possibility that the store was going to have to move or that the store was going to have to close. Um, we uh, were in the midst of a, a long uh, negotiation with the new building owners, and um, things looked grim for a while, but I'm happy to say that we did, we did come to an agreement. We do have a lease, and AVOLs will continue to be at this location, hopefully for years to come. All right. Um, now a little uh, shameless self-promotion. Uh, tomorrow night at 7 p.m. on Higher Ground, which is a public radio program broadcast live from Phyllis Hall. Yours truly will be reading a few poems. So if you uh, have nothing better to do and you'd like to uh, come to a live radio show, come to Phyllis Hall or, or tune in at 7. It's Higher Ground. And uh, later this month, I'm very happy... Uh, to have the opportunity to host a reading for a um, gentleman by the name of James Wagner. He's originally from Fond du Lac. He uh, spent a number of years in Madison, and he's been teaching out at uh, Syracuse University for about the last six years. And he has a, a new book of poetry, his first book of poetry, published by Third Bed Press called The False Sun Recordings, which just came out. And he's doing a Midwest tour to promote his book, and he'll be stopping here at A-Balls on Thursday, October the 30th at uh, 8 p.m., I believe it is. Um, there'll be a, uh, a notice in the Isthmus and the Cap Times for that, uh, for that reading as well. Well, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about tonight's featured reader because I suspect most of you probably know him better than I do. And if you don't, you'll certainly know him by the time, by the, time the evening's over. Uh, John Tushin was born in Chicago in 1949 and grew up in the Chicago area. He attended the University of Wisconsin here in Madison and has lived in Madison off and on since about 1967. And it was shortly after that time that John gave his first public reading, which may or may not have taken place in this building, depending on John's memory when you talk to him. Um, but uh, it's been uh, 35 years since then that he's been giving readings. And he has received numerous grants, scholarships, and awards for his work and has published four, book, four books of poetry. He's currently writing a book of memoirs, uh, tentatively titled Ambitious Learnings, Memoirs of an Ex-Poet Laureate. And his most recent project is editing, producing, and distributing the State Street Poetry Sheet, which I'm happy to say is supported by advertising dollars from locally owned and independent businesses here in the State Street area. John's also recently received a grant for his work on the poetry sheet which will enable him to pay contributing poets for their work, something which doesn't happen very often and for which I think John deserves a round of applause. <laughs> Why don't you keep that applause going? I'd like to introduce to you tonight's featured reader, John Tushin. I 
we just read. The, I just read this uh, Doug Mo uh, story, and you know Doug Mo is a nice guy. <clears throat> as long as he keeps saying nice things about me, he's a wonderful guy. But um, no, nah, he's a nice guy all the way around. I think. But he said in here that I. Uh, he said in here that there was a. Uh, a magazine that did the interview. Okay, here it says, here it goes. Okay, in in 1999, a major online journal, Poetic Voices, devoted 7,000 pages to the man <laughs> and his poem. <laughs> you know, who said? Let's see, uh, either Clark or or, uh, or uh, uh, Tom said, "Geez, right up there with fucking Dante and Melville." And, uh, <laughs> 7,000 pages. Well, that's pretty cool. I'd like to see that. Pretty lean toward the end, I bet. But who knows? How about a duel? <laughs> Say what? How about a duel? I got one of those. Fucking Danny Yopak. Fuck off. Come on. <laughs> and I bet you thought it was just Gar years. Jerry Garcia's <laughs> in there. <laughs> God, it's only been a couple decades. You came in from what, Santa Fe? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Now I know I can't fuck up. I'll share a little <laughs> more about that. If you know about Gallery 853 uh, on Willie Street, then became survival graphics. And Danny started this whole thing off in Dan seven. Danny Yopak oh started I this whole thing off in uh, seventy four, I think. When uh, when all the people were running from Mifflin Street, because well, it was just like the Lower East Side in New York. Bad drugs came into Mifflin. Bad drugs came in there, and then all the smart people, creative people, moved to. Um, the Near East Side here, well, not from the Lower East Side there, but you know what I mean. And uh, uh, so there was this big trend to move from the Mifflin area uh, to uh, the Near East Side, and Yopak was one of the uh, people in the vanguard of that movement, and it was pretty cool. I don't believe it. This is too good to be true. So, um, I said I was going to start with this poem, and I will. I wrote it in 1970. And it's a true story. All my uh, work is true, kind of. <laughs> Some more than others, let's just say that. Uh, Hitch Boston, hike Toronto, and the folks in between, they all call me Tonto. A dirty little bar off Mass Turnpike, night rain and upstate New York. Cowboys in I walk, wet dripping. Give me a beer. Boy, kid, you sure do look like one. Like one what? Well, some people would hit me for saying this, but you sure as do look like, yeah, he sure as does. Yeah, he sure as hell does, says a fat little blonde girl as she spits on the floor. Would you give me a beer? You part engine, kid? The place gets quiet, and I can hear the rain outside, and I wish I was out there. Just a little bit. Now, can I have a beer? Well, engines ain't so bad as long as they're sober. Well, we even have this uh, colored fella comes in here once in a while. Yeah, Betty really digs it, too, you fucker. I whisper under my breath as the hard hat's looking harder. Farmers squinting in the dark through pig shit eyes. What you say, kid? Give me beer. Why, sure, boy, just speak up. Where are you from, kid? Atlantis. <laughs> Where's that, boy? Just up over Donovan's Reefer. <laughs> oh, Atlantic City, huh? No. Well, drink up, kid. The bar's closing. Thanks. 
back on the turnpike, still raining and kind of chilly, and I'm thinking that it'd be nice to have a floor for even that fat little blonde girl to spit on. <laughs> now, I didn't never apologize, never explain when it comes to poetry, right? <laughs> this is a, uh, a, a song I wrote, and I'm not going to sing it, this one. I wrote it in 1983. It's called, I'm Too Beat to Punk Out With You. I was walking down the street the other day when this young punk fell in my way. He had purple hair and a ripped up shirt, neon eyes and fingers full of dirt. He looked at me, his eyes all flashed and said, you ought to see the places I've been trashing and they're out to get me because I have no fear. I got 16 cents and leather gear. I hate my mother and father and sister too, and if I had some time, I'd lay some hate on you. Well, he kept talking, and I kept walking, and then he said, you a member of the old farts club? <laughs> then I said, no, young fella, I'm only a bud. You're in this garden that grows real fast with very little future and a sordid past. Oh, he said, the new punk too? No, I said, I'm too beat. Beat to punk out with you. <laughs> Kid turned out to be my son. <laughs> um, I'm just going to mix it up. This is uh, called One of Those Lines, written in 1994. I rolled down her ruby cheek. I was angry and hot. It was 1974. I became one of those lines you see there today. I was thinking about my mother's, or from my mother's. I was thinking about my son's mom, Sonny Kaler. Many of you who know her know her. And I was thinking about her when I wrote it. This is poem for C.H. C.H. is a uh, crazy horse. To lay it down easy, to lay it down with grace, a dream made up in broken dream teepees and over dining room lace. When there's a hole in the casket and dirt filling your face, Promises long ago sold away flatten the spirit, slow the pace, makes the heart leaden in life's old corral. When they want to put you in heaven and all you want is a cheap hotel. <coughs> <coughs> At least the right to live. Dancing to Satie. Eric Satie, which is a trick. If you can pull it off, let me know. I want to watch. <laughs> the wicked, trembling loneliness in that mansion bought on a mule's back was severed by your smile when you asked, can you dance to Satie in the snow? Discordance is my only virtue. So lamps low and cracked, and the cracked and frosted windows open, we swirled nakedly surrounded only by stretched out flats and lows of what might have been. Melody and harmony are history. Now this um, is new, but it's I, uh, it's based on an event in 1967. It, it could be subtitled, though, a, a poem whose title is longer than the poem. It's called 
trying to catch some sleep in the cement crotch of America's vast interstate highway system outside of Jersey City one night when the moon was hard and the rain was warm and Dale just kept laughing. <laughs> damn, damn, it was cold, damn. <laughs> this is a, a poem for somebody who I met years ago, and, and uh, we lived there, became more friends, or friendly, friendly, or became friend, and and then as you know, friends are wont to do on you. Uh, he died, you know? And it's, I don't have a name for it, but I see it says up here, I just picked, I just picked these out before, I didn't pick them out singularly, I just grabbed them. It says, uh, this is raw, not suggested for children. <laughs> Tom? <laughs> I'm so greedy and I'm so mean, I gotta wash my dick in a washing machine. Pig-headed assholes announcing you gotta watch what you say. Pushed a button and pushed it pearly hard. Made me wanna click before I clean and piss on that American scream that whips the weakest, perhaps the best and the sweetest, like old Gregorio, free now from America, laying down now and kinda quiet next to lover boy of that monster lady. You'd spit up that as Celtic as hell dark and deep cognac, Gregorio. Hey, baby, you knew this was coming. A and B split before you. C, but now next to P, tend over America, Gregorio. It's getting pale. Gregorio is Gregory Corso. A and B was L and, uh, and then B is Mr. Burroughs. And, um, oh, see, I, I don't, Corso was in love with Percy Shelley's work. That's the reference to the lover boy of, the mo of that monster lady. Um, and before he, w he knew he was dying, and it, there were a bunch of people who wanted to get him to, um, or to get, uh, the burial site for him in, in Rome. Gregorio always wanted to go back to Italy. Italy really loved Corso. They gave him the highest award of all civilians, um, Italian art, this kind of things. It was really a good deal, and he wanted to be buried. In Italy, he wanted to be buried in the cemetery that uh, 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 Shelley was buried in. And things looked real bleak, but some people, uh, friends of his, <coughs> got together and and arranged this whole thing. But then there was the thing with the governments, and they were screwing them around. But then someone took care of that. And it turns out, you know, the, the ultimate good story is that not only was he uh, able to be buried there, but He's also within the shadow of the same tree that Shelley is buried under, too. So those two cats are probably having a pretty damn good time, uh, you know, looking down on themselves and uh, surveying the situation. The neat thing is, is that Corso got to know this before he died. So he was, he was uh, one happy little Italian uh, right up to the... Uh, Right up to the time he left the room. Well, we're coming close to Christmas. It's called The Wrinkle Round Your Lies. Hey there, Santa, step off your sleigh. Step off in Pine Ridge. South Bronx is a honeymoon. Happy holidays. Landmines and dreams. There is a change in the death-blown evening. 
sobs smother sirens, weeping slowly lingers into a past time, and rest, peace, hope are nothing, nothing but lingering gems, tarnished, faded, another futuristic memory blown away by hindsight. Malcolm's misery. Um, I'm not. Um, it's kind of my fault, I suppose. But I, I'm not just. Uh, I don't just exclusively read beat poetry. In fact, there's not very many beat poets that I like. Um, I mean the, the uh, poetry, and and I'll dispel one thing r right now to a couple people I know I've talked to. This, uh, I never liked Kerouac's work, <laughs> and uh, still don't. And I swear I put on more miles than he did. Anyway, <laughs> so there. <laughs> but I liked what he did and what they did. They opened this up. They opened up the whole scene in that 50s and early 60s culture where everyone was walking in. And, you know, it was uh, duck and cover time. You hear a noise, slide under your desk and protect yourself from being uh, annihilated by uh, the atomic bomb. They built strong desks back then. <laughs> <laughs> But this is in reference to Malcolm Lowry, whose work I also liked. It's called Malcolm's Misery. She whispered under that old volcano, Don't sleep too tight tonight, my dear. The hostiles are gathering. Pump the lead, darling. Make their frail bodies flattering. She's, she slipped away over burning coals to another man's tent, stole his grenades, and off she went out, so far out, to meet the hostiles. A nightmare of inches, a nightmare of miles. Uh, the... Uh, uh, I, I know that in October of 1968, I read uh, perhaps three times, two times I know for sure, because they were the first two times, and one, uh, as, as Mo wrote in that story, was with, I was working with the Broom Street Theater people, and they rented a building, we rented a building, it was called the Women's Center, and they threw a bacchanal and, you know, poetry and music and skits and, and uh, plays, and, and that's when I read the first time. And the Women's Center happens to be this building, and it was upstairs. It was just, there, I don't know what's up there now, but there was a stage up there in this big really nice place and it's kind of, kind of the and the other time I read w was for a student organization and it was at Trip Commons and you know given it was 1968 I can't remember which came first Trip Commons you know I don't know <laughs> but uh, when when Mo interviewed me for that he said let's go with the one that's on Felder Okay. I was probably tripping at both of them anyway, so it doesn't really make any difference. Since Americans like the French so much, um, I thought I'd be a jackass and uh, I'm American and, and uh, I, I lived, uh, Sherry Morris and I had uh, apartment at uh, 10 Rue du Man uh, in, uh, in Paris. Now, that's, that's Main Street, right? Rue du Man. Main Street, Paris, pretty cool, huh? But it's actually, Rue du Man is only about a block long, and it's 
But yeah, I'm not. Well, that's about that wide. And it runs into Avenue de Man, which is. But this is called Rue de Man. A one way street, a street swimming with outlaws, some mad, others just crazy. Shiv slit through his belly. I stepped over him, didn't want to get involved. But I did look back, and this is what I saw. A last gasp for air, a final plea for freedom, a desperate stare at a half full moon reflecting on that silvery blade dug into his body in the half moon shade. Bright red blood on the bricks under a pensive moon meets justice as justice as it's played mocks that dead man on the bloody bricks where he is laid. But I was an American, so, like I said, I stepped over him. Fuck the moon. That's really not quite true. Um, this one, Sherry and I were coming back one night from uh, from the cafe from a cafe that we used to spend a lot of time in and we were walking past and there was this fight and this, this one guy got stabbed and he was in Algeria and the Algerians really get fucked around a lot in Paris and and I was going to, uh, Sherry and I had been at the cafe a long time and I was going to, you know, step over, this is on the way home, it's dark, it's about 3 a.m. and I was going to step in and settle the situation for these guys, you know. <laughs> Sherry just goes <laughs> drags me home. So I didn't but then I thought, well, let's see, how would an American, a true American would do it? You know, a true American would step over and sneer or something. I didn't do well either, but I was going to help him, but you know, hindsight tells me that I would have most likely been laying right next to him. So not wanting to do that. This is called ribbons. I don't know how this works, if it ever works at all. But when Buddha, Jesus, Eros come marching through my hall, I gotta pay attention. I gotta face the call. There's no joy in doing this but there's no choice in sight. Captured in my ego, wings cut off in flight, I thought myself a hero by throwing ribbons to the light. You remember that time he came up to the kitchen at Gallery 53? Mm -hmm. Dave Snake Array, Tommy Glover, and uh, Krum or Rain Glover. Ray likes his poem, so I, I had, was going to write something. He emails me back and forth, and I was going to, oh yeah, he emailed me back about this particular poem, and I, I, won't t I won't say what he said, but I like the way he signs off. He says, remember, 186,000 miles per second isn't just a good idea, it's the law. <laughs> No, I'm not very good at math, but I... Okay. This is a poem. It's called Luna, Sad Luna. Nothing twists the night as curiously as a quarter moon. What wonderment, what danger, and what sublime anger. I clapped my hands. Silver quarter moon did not release. Stuck to my palms like humanity. The sweating did not cease. And there's a, a quote under here, too, that uh, it's by Ken <coughs> Kesey. It says, um, when you don't know where you're going, you have to stick together just in case somebody gets there. <laughs> I think that's what we were doing at 53. <laughs> um, Angela's cello. 
This is for Angela McJunkin, the woman who plays cello uh, uh, with me sometimes when I read. And I don't think she's here tonight. Uh, this is called Angela's Cello. In that bungalow behind the heart, where various notes and notables meet, there's this music pouring through the veins, shuffling through the streets, with intensity admired by the bloodied, desired by those she meets, and by a ghost of notes long forgotten, but emerging now, from bedtime or music sheets, from the bed of chaos to dreams complete. And, you guys doing all right? Am I, uh, you're not gonna lynch me or anything when I'm, <laughs> um, Well, she's not here, but she'll see the tape. David, hi. Hi. Um, this is called One Moment. And although it's not about Fat Richard, uh, I, um, I used to, uh, uh, Fat Richard Drake, he was a, uh, a really wonderful uh, jazz man, sax player. Uh, around here and around the country, and he, he toured Europe with Luther Allison and, you know, a whole bunch of good people. And he and I used to work together there a lot, and, and whenever I, he liked this poem, and he would always come in real nice with the sax, so whenever I read this, I, I keep hearing the sax, maybe you'll hear it, I don't know. but. Um, um, you know, it was like that. It, R Richard left the room, too. Um, it's called One Moment. A saxophone snaps back at the night. Your fingertips are touching my fingertips. And when you whisper, I want you to want me, your voice cracks hard like years of cigarettes and pain have taken away all the softness. And your eyes, your green, green eyes, look down and fire as if looking at nothing's shadow. And the corners of your mouth also move downward, but only slightly, as though the smallest smile may appear next and surprise both of us. <clears throat> and then we would have to laugh a little at our tenderness so small and gentle that it hangs on the alto saxophone note that's blowing away from us now, sheathed and heaven-bound. See, I brought this table up here just uh, I told Ron I thought it'd be nice so I could put the stuff there and I wouldn't get messy. <laughs> yeah. Make a bigger table. Yeah. Or fewer poems. No. The Ghost of the Fess. Now, the Fess Hotel um, was a nice, uh, was a really wonderful place. We can talk more about that later if you want. So it was a hotel, and then it became a restaurant called The Fess, and now it's called The Great Dane, which I've, you know, only gone to a few times. Seems like a nice place. They have some good beer, um, but it ain't The Fess. And this is called The Ghost of The Fess. I, this is written in 1984. Cocovan and careful manners bathed in the light of a single candle. How poetic. And that damned salmon begged for lemon as those shadows of worry, age, and doubt, creeping and real, danced and disappeared off our faces. This, is, was, this was your doing. This was your art. You appeared unpredictable and certainly unnatural, 
like a gunshot through lace, or a poet with her face caught with her face in her soup, or an answered lover received in an envelope with the smudges of a thousand no forwarding addresses. For decades, I caught the aroma of your coming and going like footsteps, light as a ballet slipper, fleeing across a charcoal in hell. Damn, I even wore my thumb condom for that. You will remain up there at the old fest, sipping Chardonnay through that hole in your heart, which was so big and inviting and fell into the garden, making flowers and wasps with real stingers for real lovers who would later come back, perhaps to be stung again. Um, this is heavy. This is uh, uh, to my twin sister. Happy birthday, A.T. Pray with predator near. She shifts through seeds. Maybe there's a lunch. Maybe there's a critical cigarette. Maybe there's a comical hunch that life's complete on some sort of ticket. She wears elbows of pain and half-closed eyes, hiding what's left of the shame. It's a scab, but she won't pick it. In the yellow mornings, she screams at walls that may or may not scream back. She slithers to the phone, a black and ivory asp. She stops, weeps, until the train has crossed the tracks. But the knob-bane nimbled fingers, digits and number that's forever on hold. Again on the avenue, No. Censorship. <laughs> Self censorship. <laughs> which, is, which is the only kind that should be. Um, lastly, f falling. And this was written about. Um, uh, well, I, uh, a woman proposed to me, and, and uh, yeah, <laughs> and uh, I said yes, you know, and, but it didn't happen. And <clears throat> this is a poem, it was about this time of year, so last leaf falling. This last leaf falling has sliced my heart, its jagged edges <laughs> A fragile jigsaw, noiseless, but in rustling company, has ripped through me, and I stand silent, too stunned even to mock a gesture. Again, this madness that pulls me to beauty has me dancing an autumnal dance, alone, bloody, and stone-faced. If this is some form of ending, at least remind me of the beginning, Remind me of a time before all those promises became leaves that scattered when I came to collect them. And this one, we don't, this is called Your Mother's Eye. And we won't do this one. It's, uh, it's, um, it's about, uh, it's uh, nearly 20 pages long. I remember yeah, it was started in 1969, and I finally finished it in, in 1992. Um, I'm a slow typist. And, uh, <laughs>
And see, I should see Clark. If you'd only given me a few more minutes, I'd have had this all figured out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> <take> more years. <laughs> Um, here, this is funny. This is not mine. Uh, it, uh, it was written by P.S. Mueller. P. He's, he's not here tonight. Um, he, he wrote this for me uh, when I uh, finally got a graduate degree here. We were going to throw a party and, and Pete wrote the uh, wrote the invitation, and I, I love it because it's so typically uh, P.S. Miller. It's called Graduation Party Invite Poem. Let's see if I can catch this. Uh, a Madison guy named of Tushin went to school at a big institution. He learned faster and faster, surprised every master, even people who didn't have a collusion. <laughs> a party is planned for this tuition, and the fest seems a proper solution. We'll feast at the least on the roughest of beasts, and what's left will be utter confusion. You should, you should. Come, uh, let's see, you should come on an evening that's juni. Day 17 is your best opportunity. <laughs> For an evening of rhyme far exceeding this crime, and the tunes won't be nearly as loony. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love that guy. I'm gonna uh, switch gears and read from uh, this book I'm working on, and the, the, the book is called Am Ambitious um, Learnings, but it, it goes back and forth. It's either Ambitious Leanings or Ambitious Learnings, and, you know, it depends, and it's memoirs of, a, of an ex-poet laureate. And it kind of describes a few of the things. And I know this looks awful doing this, and I'm sorry, but uh, here it is. And I'll just read portions of it. It's, uh, it, it has a, a, what I, I hope is, a, well, to me it's an interesting <laughs> format. Each chapter has, uh, it, it's introduced as like a, uh, uh, a wire, a newswire bulletin, i.e., so it, it'll be like Madison, 1981. The next chapter might be uh, Berkeley, 1974. You know, and it just kind of bounces back and forth. And so there's no real continuity. It's uh, or or <coughs> maybe there is. And the intro of the, to the uh, to this book uh, goes something like this, and these are just segments of what I'm uh, proposing to do. And the intro goes something like this: a large number of vignettes, all beginning as follows: 1973 Paris, 2001 Madison. This will be an autobiography. With each piece introduces a newswire bullets, and it will be written in poetic prose, detailing experiences gained in and around some of the following people and places, Ellen Ginsberg, Sharon Morris, Sonny and Jordan Kaler, Paul Sagan, Ruth Stone, Phoebe Stone, George McGovern, Gregory Corso, Dylan Lennon, Silverman, Bill Miles, Samuel Beckett's girlfriend, and the lovers, uh, Belgian waitress, Parisians, Americans, Afro-Americans, a South American farmer's daughter, a Japanese chemist, an Algerian prostitute working in Paris, uh, an American Indian dancer, an Israeli cellist, a Canadian drug dealer with the clap, a Mexican poet, a Dutch maid, a Lithuanian psychologist, and perhaps a Martian or two. And the others, the hailers, war makers, a blind photographer, crazies, mayors, 
judges, some letters, some letters, daughters, gossip columnists, painters, poets, thieves, toothless colonies, a murderer, many queens, but no kings, actors, and many schizophrenics. And finally, the places Montreal, Toronto, New York City, Boston, Cambridge, Madison, Boulder, San Francisco, New Orleans, Tampa, Vermont, Newport, Paris, Hamburg, Echtenach, Chicago, Milwaukee, Columbus, and Prairie, Berkeley, and a few more places. Um, and the one that I mainly wanted to read was, or is this uh, prose, it's, it's a true story. It happened right up the street at 407 uh, State Street. And I wrote this as a poem uh, called Magdalene. And that's the poem, and I know a number of you have heard that poem, and now I want to read the prose version. And, you know, if you want to talk to me about it afterwards, I'd appreciate any kind of um, insight that you might have. You know, poetry as a prose is kind of, as a, po as a prose. <laughs> um, it's called Blood on the Tiles. Madison, 1971. Madeline came over on a very gray Sunday afternoon. It was October. I was living at 407 State Street, a third floor walk-up semi-dingy apartment, walls painted royal blue, woodwork a flat white, in the bathroom, all white, the floor was made up of small black and white checkered tiles. It usually looked pretty good until it was splashed with blood, then it went from cool to cold. Madeline had beautiful and long red hair, a, wonder, a soft and wonderful place to hide. A red, silky forest that smelled like hair, clean hair, no scent in the world is that perfect. Joel had chosen that particular day to smash her face again. Tears blended with the light blue eyeliner and blood. She wanted to scream but had never screamed before, didn't know how. So she whimpered. Her face buried in my shoulder, she whimpered and stuttered and bled. Nervous, anxious, and alcoholic, I sat her on the sofa. I'll slide back, I'll slide across the street and gild us some wine. There's some neosporin in the cabinet, be right back. I kissed her forehead, left the door unlocked, and ran down the stairs. Outside, the cold, October air filtered through Granis. I choked in it, shaking like a prey with predator near. Across the street to Badger Liquor, I bought a bottle of Chardonnay from a polite little clerk attempting to grow a mustache. He said, hey, I know you. No, no you don't. Back across the street, up the dusty stairwell, through my unlocked door, home. Home can be unsettling. Magdalene was not on the sofa, not in the kitchen, not out on that windy little balcony. Suddenly I knew where she was. I stumbled over a chair on my way to the bathroom. The first thing I saw was darkening red blood inching tile by little tile toward the floor, on its way out, escaping. Then I saw Magdalene, curled, fetal, whiter than usual, even stranger than usual. Both of her thin blue arms were slashed, slashed deeply, vertical, deep and vertical. The little black and white tiles were being overrun by dark blood, Madeline's lonely, beat up, worn down blood. I wanted to take her picture. That's a portion of that. As long as we're in this kind of... This is 
another <coughs> chapter. It's called Taking a Belt for the Catholics. Sun Prairie, <coughs> 1953. So I was adopted by a pair of sadistic Philistines. Adopted for insurance money. Murder was on the wing. I knew it. I felt it. I tried to run away from it when I was four. Got a long stick, red bandana. Wrapped my baseball glove and moldy cheese sandwich in that hopeful red bandana and took off. It had been raining for days, so I wore my boots, too. Three blocks toward freedom, I was knee-deep in mud, trapped. My boots, isolated in their paces, could go no further. I was stuck. Freedom eluded me once again. The Philistines pulled up in their 49 Ford, grabbed me from the mud, and threw me in the back seat. I knew, and I shuddered at what would happen next. Inside the garage, pungent with the smell of oil, gas, and hatred, he made me pull my pants down. Not having the manners to ask me to bend over, he pushed my head down to my knees, pulled his belt off, and buckle-side ready, whipped my four-year-old ass. I don't remember which was flowing more, tears or blood, or dreams of freedom. It was then I swore at four that I would never give up, that regardless of any pain, obstruction, or beating, this sorry ass would survive. In my early years, I served a lot of time in that stinking garage, beaten for laughing in church, for looking up a nun's habit, black and white polka dots. <laughs> for closed mouth kissing genie at the foot of the statue of our savior for trading my holy cards for baseball cards times were tough and they got tougher like I said murder was on the wing and that's a portion of it <coughs> here's how uh, I'll uh, get into this ASAP uh, a, a what I like to think of is a portrait of a very wonderful uh, human being. It's called Ginsburg and Kidney Stones. Malibu's in 1981. Perhaps the most enduring qualities of Allen Ginsburg was his gentleness. Everyone who knew him has a story like this, and I doubt that mine is any different, but here it goes the only way. In the pit of the Madison Civic Center, they call it the Crossroads, Alan, Corso, and Burroughs sat on a single bench playing to the press. Corso kept standing up and settling down, an old trick that all of us drunks use. Burroughs kept smoking his cigarettes, looking at the carpet, looking, yawning at me, hidden conveniently behind the pillar. Ginsburg was sitting, nearly curled, making Zen contact with his Timex as the questions flew in. What was Kerouac really like? Do any of you think that drugs should be legalized? Um, can you imagine asking William Burroughs that? <laughs> I mean, talk, you know, you got to give it to, you know, audacity. And then, a, you know, always a good clincher. What do you think of Wisconsin? <laughs> um, and, okay, behind my pillar, I nearly spit up my drink. Scotch and stability don't really mix. Silverman finally got the hint, stilled up, and announced that the interview was over. Of course, I sat down, Burroughs woke up. Ginsburg uh, gave a slight bow and fled to my pillar. Touche, I need some help. I need to take a nap. I can't make it to the Union, the Memorial Union. We had rented him a, a room there. I need to lay down now. Come with me. I led, them, I led him up to the third floor gallery. Frank Stella's work was on exhibit. Beautiful autumn light through those great windows in that great room sprayed and shamed those damn fluorescent lights. We pushed two green benches together. I have kidney stones. I'm in pain, Touche. Alan sat 
then folded into himself, and I think he went away. The gallery was empty except for the sun, Frank Stella's wonder, and Ellen Ginsberg's body resting on two green benches. I had keys, so I looked around, caught a glimpse of peace, walked out, and locked the doors. Now, we'll, uh, I'll just kind of slow it down and uh, wind down. Uh, and I was going to not do it, and then I was going to do it, and then I did it. <laughs> and I'm not telling you what it was. We thought it was an intro to the poem. <laughs> oh, wh wh while I'm searching, I have another very short poem I wrote. It came out in the, that first book I had, Junk Mail, came out in uh, the late 60s. And it, it's called um, Questioned by a Beautiful but Lonely Woman on a Night When There Was No Moon. Tushin, everyone says nice things about you. How come you're such an asshole? <laughs> <laughs> That's that one. <laughs> I love it when people are out front like that. <laughs> now, uh, um, I'll just read these two, and then we'll do a q and I still don't know if I'm going to um, sing or not. Uh, I'm trying to break my finger on in the meantime. <coughs> and. Uh, this poem, again, uh, in fact, these two are number mostly people know, I suppose, but because it's so close to Christmas, <coughs> uh, feel compelled to do it every year. It's called Xmas Poem. I've been around code, Kate tailed my bell and propeled, it must be Christmas. I've been creskied, prangied, pennied, and seared, it must be Christmas. I've been tonked, computerized, fisher-priced, and aced, it must be Christmas. <laughs> I've been black and deckered, chess and checkered, blue balled and sold out, it must be Christmas. Jesus Christ, right home. <laughs> Under the wet autumnal moon, we sat in the old car, sweet jazz on the radio, our clothes on the floorboards. You moved your hand and rubbed my temple. It was a 64 Mustang with a stick shift and white walls. I kissed your eyelids, both of them. It had bucket seats, but we were in the back a smooth black vinyl and got 25 miles per gallon a pair of foam dice in the window too. We were sweaty and nervous, it was our first time. We had read all the books. The rear end was jacked up, it had a four barrel and could top out at 130. You showed me where to touch, everything was liquid hot. I had gas. That old Mustang had spring shocks, mag wheels, and a tinted windshield, but no racing stripe. Racing stripes are like tattoos, always look better somewhere else. I got real dizzy and shaky. Joey Capizzuto had warned me not to do it stoned, at least not the first time. Our asses were sticking on the smooth black vinyl. Our kisses were sloppy but well-intentioned. I was worried about the emergency brake, if I'd set it. We were parked on a hill in the back of a cemetery, and I could see us rolling over tombstones, bare-assed in the back seat, rolling over somebody's Uncle Harry, as all that sweet jazz, sweet jazz, tumbled over us. <laughs> Thanks. Now we could have 
time for a little Q and A. Like uh, I, you know, I've never done this before in school. When I taught in the, in those high schools, uh, I would do Q and As, but I've never done this in a, a, a you know a something like this. <laughs> yes, doctor. I t I like Madeline both ways. Okay, I'm not. That's an interesting. Uh, this, yeah, yeah, I did too. I, yeah. Don't let me die up here. I mean, I probably did. Maybe. Well, John, yeah, there's the World War One phrase about uh, once they've been to Paris, uh, how you're going to keep them down on the farm, something like that. What brought you back? You've been out of. Wisconsin, you've been to San Francisco and Paris. Why are you here? <laughs> <laughs> um, th that's a really good question. My son, uh, my son Jordan, who's uh, 27 years old now, asked me that a similar thing, and it, it's a, it's, it's probably the most existential question I've had to deal with myself. He said to me. Um, when you lived in New York the first time, how come you didn't stay? And, you know, I said, well, I could answer that, but I, I'm not going to right now. And I could lay that on you, too. But, um, uh, because if I would have stayed in a lot of those places at those particular times, I would uh, be dead. I'd either be, uh, either, you know, famous, well-known, or I'd be dead. It's kind of one of the two, you know. It's kind of the way it is in my life. It's always extremes, one or the other. But and maybe deep inside, I just didn't want to be dead yet. And so I kept coming back here. Um, Cl Rod Clark t told me a good uh, thing one day. He and I were talking about the same thing. And I was trying to figure out why I came here in the first place. And Clark said, ah, you're just looking for a place to sit down. And I kind of like that. So did you ever get into your serial killer story? My serial killer? Oh, the poem, hey. Uh, <laughs> the uh, poem that, I, I have this uh, thing called just an older poem, and it's a, I have this mailing list of some friends, and I just send out poems now and then really, you know, probably bugs the hell out of most of the people on the list, but one time I was trying to, trying to come up with a, a, a name, or a, the title for a poem. No, I was trying to come up with a poem, and I had a choice in my mind of writing something about a, a little girl in ballet or something, or about what a, a serial killer would have for breakfast. And so I wrote them both. I don't remember seeing the end result. I think I'd, maybe I didn't, the serial killer one was too long, so I probably didn't send it out, because I just didn't want to bother typing all that crap. <laughs> it wasn't very good anyway. The period between 1965 and 1975 was a kind of uh, a kind of golden age for poetry, especially for people getting up and reciting poetry. Uh, there was the uh, sort of culture of the revolution, which contributed to that. There was uh, cheap offset printing, which came out in the early 70s, allowed people to publish books. Uh, that was a very special period, and we all remember it in a certain way. Um, how do you think uh, uh, this this last decade? How has this last decade been different for writing poetry? Uh, what what is what has changed uh, from that sort of golden or, or brass decade, sixty five to seventy five? What's different today about writing poetry and reading poetry in Madison? Um, well, I, I, you know, like everything else 
it's helped. I think the computers helped a whole lot. It's it's brought a, a lot of uh, diverse trips together, groups, and so on. Um, I think. Uh, I mean, there's the the amount of poetry readings in this town is incredible. I mean, to me, for the size of this town, I mean, you look in that uh, in that isness. And, you, you know, there's something going on in there. Almost every night, someone is reading poetry or poetry and music, or poetry, which I think is pretty <coughs> far out. I think that's, that's really nice. When we, you know, back then, there really wasn't that much going on. What, what started to go on back then is what we built, quite frankly. Um, people. Moby and Guns Quest, Broom Street Theater, uh, uh, Albatross, Kaleidoscope Takeover, Quest Publishing, Quest, and Down the Opex Ventures, and but prior to that there was nothing, and uh, there weren't. I mean, poetry readings. There just weren't poetry readings around unless we made them, and now, man, they're all over the place. So that's that's a really good part. The quality of the poetry, I don't know. I don't, I'm not going to judge that. I just like the idea of the fact that people are out there trying to share that kind of communicative and beautiful energy, trying to, you, you don't know, whether they do it well or not. The fact is, is that they're attempting to communicate, and that's the most goddamn thing, that, the most important goddamn thing I can think of is communication. The second, as long as I see the w the worst thing in the f world to me, I think is conformity, and that's a sad thing because that I see also at the same time we have this beautiful stuff growing and uh, going on and young people coming up and you know really gutsy and terrific young people. At the same time, this conformity is is growing and and. It's all over, and it, it's all over the place, and it's really deadly. I think I think conformity will steal your soul just as fucking fast as uh, crack cocaine could, uh, drugs, or uh, so. I think that's uh, it's something that we have. I don't know that we have. It's something I have to be aware of. Do you mean that uh, people are? need to individualize their voices more, that there's a danger they'll all begin to sound alike? I, I think so. I, I think so. I wasn't, you know, just speaking about poetry. I was speaking in general terms, but certainly in, certainly in poetry, too. I, I mean, it's, who wants to all sound the same? Who wants to be just like so-and-so? And, and then you get these cats like Ash, Ashcan, or what's his name, Ashcan? Ashcroft, um, <laughs> you know, who who have the audacity to 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 brag about the fact and and Dummiesfeld, Rummiesfeld, Rummy Rummiesfeld, um, who are telling American people to watch what they say. I mean, I tell you one thing: if they say that to enough poets. <laughs> They're going to get a fucking earful of something. You know, cause you, I think that's the last thing in the world that you should tell one an American poet or two an American, you know, watch what you say. And then we're in Iraq so we can give them freedom of speech. <laughs> yeah. Tom, you feel like singing? Sure. Okay, Tom and I were going to do this song I wrote called um, The American Dream, and I, I rolled it and I sent, I sent it to William Burroughs, he was uh, Don and Lawrence, and I sent it, and he never replied, um, which, which means, it doesn't mean a whole hell of a lot, but you know, at least he didn't write back and say I didn't like it. <laughs> so, um, and maybe I'll stick around and, and play a song. If I do play a song, it would be this one, which I'll read quickly. Uh, um, it's in the new copy of in the new copy of Mobius.
which is laying, it's on, it's right out the door, Mobius, and it's called, um, it's, it's called Metiahe, which is a Lakota term. Uh, John Trudeau uh, told me a little bit about this. It means something like, uh, what the fuck? All right. That's what it means. <laughs> so it's called Metiahe Ahai. Subtitled, uh, A Song for the Other JT Poet with a Big Nod to BD and PRS Who Will Understand. Um, oh, please, let's put away our screams. Just nationalize our genes and play a little poker on the side. Shoot that good old gray horse, bury him under the golf course, deep, deep, deep with our pride. No, there ain't no sense in crying long as the chips keep flying and the feathers of freedom don't break our stride. The paint from our face no longer has grace and shame appears around the corner. What can we do? Buy a tuxedo or two and bury the past like a mourner? Ah, who gives a shit? It's time we just quit and sneak that blue horse across the border. Okay, thanks a lot. <laughs> Tom Neal. Uh, my, you want to do the one we were going to do together? You want me to do that one, try and do that one? Or just like, it's too experimental, I'll just do my own stuff. I think I broke my finger while I was reading. Yeah, yeah, okay. I point Okay. In lieu of doing yours, I'll do the one oh, I... Oh, come on. You can't one. do American Dream? Oh, I can do American Dream. All right. Put my glasses on. I'm glad you're um, recording this. It's just a touch disconcerting. It's sort of like the first time... It's no big deal, but it's like the first time you ever, like, did a reading where there was a tape recorder on, you know, and you assumed that... You know, so they were going to hear your voice through all eternity? Uh, <laughs> Watch what you say. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I think they've only got a few minutes of Yates' stuff taped because they used the tapes during the Second World War for something else. You know, they were... Yeah. Okay. Let me get this to sit up here. Well, the thing that's interesting about this is that um, when we were sitting around trying to figure out what worked with this, I never did the verses the same way twice. It was like, um, so we'll just see what happens. I'm just going to spread it out here so I get it, so I don't have to turn it over too much. For all the elders, aho, you know, who knows? Okay. It sounds like yeah, it's in tune, more or less. I can't take it back It's keeping me awake Sitting on the American dream In this hemorrhoidal state You got arts boards matrons Serving lies and tea Diamond laden ladies So 
Holy of the Deep Blue Society Their fingers rubbed raw by the art of survival They can't fill their stomachs with the pages of a Bible Ticket bill, it's keeping me awake. Sitting on the American dream in this hemorrhoidal state. People keep shuffling cards in their feet, pretending they can hide from the blood on the street while the dealer keeps smiling. As it tosses them a death card It gets caught in the pleats of their hearts A door at our face generals with gold cap teeth Hold the sword of oppression far from its sheath Butchering little countries in the name of peace Their mucus mouthed madmen Who think life is on lease Pillsbury want us to raise our children in images they like to see. Make them rich and stupid, put them on MTV. <laughs> Cut off their feelings, castrate them emotionally by telling them the macho rap, the gangster stuff you know is real poetry. I can't take it, Bill. It's keeping me away Sitting on the American dream in this hemorrhoidal state Don't pour me no shot, no I gotta see this thing through Into there's darkness all, in, though there's darkness all around us I feel me getting close to you And I know it ain't no hat trick, baby it's called just living the blues here on the street Where the mail comes late And I'm messing with the American dream here in this hemorrhoidal state I can't take it, Bill It's keeping me awake Sitting on the American dream in this hemorrhoidal Well, I got through it. Because it's an oral history, you get you get like catalogs, like you would get in Homer of so and so and so and so and so and so counted Q, coup and spotted tail and little elk spot, you know, counted second coup, and you get that kind of stuff. The various you know, <coughs> cavalry engagements, you know, and it gets repetitive. But I mean, in terms of um, hearing from living witnesses what that period of from about the mid 1860s to uh, Wounded Knee was like. It's a very, very interesting book, so it inspired this piece, which is called um, The Gray Horse. If I had enough ponies, I'd give them away. Every child we killed, every woman we raped. Oh, but there aren't enough ponies in the whole world. Eh? Bring back those herds, or the world we blew away. Ghost dance came east from Nevada. On fire. A twisted Christian sect that had its believers convinced that if they danced themselves into trance, they could resurrect the First Nations and the Herthic Plains. Sitting Bull 
was not a believer, but he was a tolerant leader of his people, and an enormous thorn in the side of the Indian agent, and had been since 1881 when he surrendered to the U.S. military. Well, this Indian agent knew that if he sent the U.S. military down to arrest Sitting Bull for complicity in the ghost dance, that he would peacefully surrender. But if he sent down the Turncoat Lakota, the Indian police, there would be trouble on the Grand River because Sitting Bull would not surrender to the Indian police. And this is exactly what happened when they came before dawn on December 15th, dragged him from his cabin, pinned his arms to his back, and with a 44 in his spine, demanded that he surrender. He said, hell no, I'm not going to surrender. And behind the gunshots, the smoke ended, 12 Lakota lay dead and dying in that cold Dakota snow, including his 16-year-old son, Crowfoot, who was dragged summarily from the cabin after the shooting had stopped and executed by the surviving Indian police. Oh, if I had enough ponies mm, to right every wrong mm, that was done in my name long before I was born Sitting Bull had toured with Buffalo Bill on an international tour that went to the great cities of the Canadian and the American East. He was hailed as the great statesman and general of his people. He was reviled as Custer's murderer. While he was on that tour, he befriended an old gray circus horse, and Buffalo Bill gave it to him as a parting gift when he left the tour in the fall of 1885. That old gray horse was there that morning on the Grand River and thought the shooting and the mayhem was the beginning of the Wild West show again, so it started going through its circus tricks. Sat down on its haunches like a big gray dog, raised its paw like it was baking for a bone and started to go through its various circus tricks. The Indian police survivors were convinced that Sitting Bull's spirit had entered that old gray horse. And since they had been given orders to bring him back dead or alive, and there was only one ox cart. They threw the body of Sitting Bull into the ox cart first, and then the four dead Indian policemen on top of him took him back to Fort Gates where they poured limestone into a pine box and buried the Lincoln of his people like a common criminal in the corner of the military cemetery. I call him Lincoln, the Lincoln of his people, because for me, Crazy Horse is probably the great, great Lakota icon of Indian resistance on the Western Plains. But for me, Sitting Bull is the great and living icon of Lakota tradition, dignity, and sovereignty. And he was buried like a common criminal in the corner of a military outpost in South Dakota. History, ha irony has a way of pouring itself out over the passage of time. And there are a couple of ironic notes to this whole episode. Buffalo Bill bought back the old gray horse, and at the Columbia Exhibition in Chicago in 1892, it was the horse that carried the colors for the American cavalry in the Grand Parade during the middle of Buffalo Bill's show. But the uh, irony that is so much more acute is that there are three towns on the Standing Rock Indian Reservation in South Dakota. One is named after the Indian agent who initiated that state-sponsored assassination, and there are two towns named after the Lakota who actually shot him. Can you imagine Sirhan, Sirhan, Massachusetts? If I had enough ponies, oh, I'd 
give them away For every child that we kill Every woman we rape Oh, but there aren't enough homes In the whole world today Bring back those herds, oh, the world we threw